step forward. Hello, this is another episode of the Then and Out podcast. We have an amazing guest here, Mr. Tom DeFalco, the infamous comic creator, slash former editor-in-chief of Marvel. You are renowned and infamous across the industry. Um, before we get into it, uh, how you doing, Ethan? My co-host, my lovely co-host there. I'm doing good, man. I, I'm in. I'm in. I'm literally in the shadow of greatness. So this is this is a good day. This is a good day. I've read so much of Tom's stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Well, l- let me say, infamous is not the word I would use. Uh, <laughs> Let's something straight right up. I've never actually been indicted. Uh, you know, <laughs> I've never actually been convicted. Let me put it that way. An indictment is not a conviction. Fair. Fair. I've never actually been convicted. Fair. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. DeFalco, before, obviously I'm going to try my best to not ask you the questions you've probably been asked a thousand times over the million interviews you have, but we got to start off with one that you probably gotten asked a million times over, uh, just how you got into comics. Were you, in your early childhood, were you a fan of comics to start with? Well, absolutely. I, um, I, I, as a young child, I discovered comic strips. And, you know, I I used to love the comic strips. And a a lot of times I just cut the comic strips out of the newspaper. Hopefully after my father had read the newspaper. If if he hadn't, there there would be other discussions. (laughs) And and a lot of times I would just, just, you know, collect all these comic strips and I'd paste them into into my my own homemade books. And um, at some family gathering, one of my uh, uh, cousins... Um, I think my cousin Johnny uh, said to me that, uh, hey, uh, I have something, I've got something for you to read. And he handed me, it was either a Batman comic or a detective comic. I don't know what it was, but I know it featured Batman. And uh, I'd never seen a comic book before. I was amazed. I loved it. Batman scared the hell out of me. (laughs) I I didn't know if he was the good guy or the bad guy, but hey, you know. I had a good time, and then I discovered that, hey, these comic book things, you can buy them, you know, at, at the local candy store. And uh, and from then on, I was uh, I was hooked. I love it. I love it. I love it. And uh, obviously, the I think it's, it's been described before that when you were writing, uh, when you were actually an editor-in-chief, that you kind of regarded uh, the managing all the different books as kind of like managing several different comic book strips. Uh, just in a bigger, grander way. So I'm guessing that you never lost that passion you have for the comic strips. Uh, I no, I I, I I still love comic strips, um, or or the comic strips that I remember. Uh, uh, it's it's funny. Somebody uh, once said, "Hey, I, you know, I'd uh, I'd like to buy some original art from you." And I said, "Original art? You know, the only original art I own are comic strips." <laughs> <laughs> Um, I do own some comic book original art, but they're, they're mainly from stories that I've worked on. Um, mm. But I don't have, I, I have a much more extensive collection of, of comic strip art. Because, um, you know, I'm a, I was a fan of Walt Kelly and, and uh, you know, uh, Leonard Starr and you know, all, the, all the great ones. I just, I, I just still love all that artwork. Right. You know, those comic amazing. To stay in the same vein of uh, comic strips, you also were a big contributor to Archie and uh, his run of comic. Can you tell me, tell me how you kind of got in the Archie? Or in, yeah, tell me that whole experience. You just well, I, when um, you know, I was I was I was kind of a stupid kid, and when I uh, I graduated college, uh, I, I knew I really wanted to be a writer, but I also thought. You know, I, I was of the generation that you had to have a full-time job. So I was looking around trying to, you know, tr- trying to find a job. And I even went to magazines that I had sold some short stories to. And they said, no, you're a writer. You, you know, sit home and write. Right. But I thought, oh, no, I, I, I have to get a job. And, uh, and at one point it occurred to me I should, you know, contact the comic book companies and see if any of them had an opening. And, and Archie uh, saw my resume and um, invited me in and offered me a job. So I, I had a I had a job and you know and I was you know, freelancing on the side. Oh, that's great. 
And mm -hmm. are there some ways that obviously there's a very different roster of characters involved with Archie, like you know, Archie and Jughead and Betty and Veronica and things of that nature. But did your experience working in, or writing in that world with those characters, did it help shape you how you wrote with the Fantastic Four or Spider-Man or Spider-Girl? Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, with Archie, I learned how to, how to construct stories and tell stories in a one-page format, in a five-page format, in a six-page format, in an eleven-page format, you know, different formats. So that I, you know, I learned how to how the how to structure stories. And that's the most important thing, because structure is, you know, if you guys are familiar with my work, you'll know know that I am an anal retentive structure. I structure <laughs> everything. Oh Absolutely. man. Absolutely. I, uh, you know, I am a devout coward, and I, you know, I, I can't sit down to start writing a story unless I know how it ends. I, I know, you know how all the bits and pieces fit together. Um, you know, because I, you know, I, I look at comic book stories as actual stories right. that should have a beginning, middle, and end, and should have a theme, and should tell you something about the human condition, whether it's an Archie story or, or Spider Girl story or you know, Fantastic Four. They, they have to contribute to, uh, you know, to, to people's understanding of, of, of what it means to be a human person. Exactly. exactly. You know, they should also, you know, if it's an Archie story, should also give you a couple of laughs. If it's a fantastic four, throw you a bit. Um, but uh, yeah, we, you know, we have to enjoy right. that. And, and speaking about Archie, um, I, I've always. You know, I, I've always maintained good relations with them because um, my former boss, Victor Gorlick, um, who passed away a couple of years ago, um, uh, a number of years ago, got in touch with me and said, hey, you want to do some stories for us? And, it, you know, it's always hard to, you know, in many regards, I look at Archie and Marvel as my homes. Sure. Um, so anytime Archie, you know, gets in touch with me, I, you know, I'm always thrilled to deal with those characters again. I, you know, yesterday they called me up and asked me if I wanted to do a Jughead story. <laughs> sure. Well, here's the funny part: they want to do a Jughead story that you know is an anniversary celebration of the '70s. And I said, "Sure, I'll, I'll do that." But you know that most of the Jughead stories I I wrote were in the actual '70s. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it's awesome. They kind of stay. I think we spoke on Fantastic Four earlier. I kind of want to. You spent a long time working on those issues, working on those stories. If you could describe your time working with the Fantastic Four in one word, what would that word be? Oh, this is a tough one. I need to throw you a curveball. I'm going to throw, you know, um, wild. We good. We wanted, oh, okay. to, you know, we wanted when we started. Um, sales of the Fantastic Four were not doing great. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the the comic book looked like at any moment it might have to be taken off the newsstand, mm -hmm. and I didn't want to be editor in chief when the Fantastic Four had to come off the newsstand. <laughs> um, so I said to Paul Ryan, you know, we are going to try to do the wildest roller coaster ride and see if we can spark sales somehow. We're we're going to do just one crazy thing after another, and um, and Paul said. Yeah, okay. And um and then we uh you know, we we just went crazy and if you if you saw that run, we, you know, even the kitchen sink appears on occasion. <laughs> <laughs> That's where you ask how famous for that. <laughs> oh man. I, I love it. Uh, we, Paul and I we, we were just doing crazy crazy things. Um we had it uh, you know, we had a structure and I used to have a chart on on how, you know, to keep track of all the uh, subplots and that sort of stuff. And most comic books, it was just a straight line. I mean, it would go up here, down there, across there. It was, mm -hmm. a, it was crazy keeping track of everything. Um, and, uh, you know, Paul and I had a great time, except at one point Paul went to a convention. He came back and he said, you know what? People, he says, you know, I'm talking to the fans. They hate what we're doing. They hate us. And I said, wow. yeah, but the sales go up every month. So, yeah, that makes, that's weird. you know, encourage them to hate us more. 
Get all those things <laughs> <laughs> oh man! And I said, one, I said to one guy, you know, you, you seem to dislike the book a lot. I said, but why do you read it if you dislike it? He says, because I have to find out what happens next. Exactly. And I exactly. said, well, you know, what exactly do you hate about it? He says, you're just so mean to all the characters. Too many, you know, too many bad things are happening to them. Can't you, can't you do an issue where nothing happens? <laughs> and I said. No. <laughs> yeah, plenty, plenty of nothing happens, but that's between issues. Right, exactly. That's boring. No one wants to see that kind of crap. No, no one wants, wants to, see to see that kind of crap. Uh, but, it. you know, people would say, you know, oh man, too many, you know, too many nasty things are happening to these guys. Yeah. But, yeah, well, that's, you know, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed right. to get you right. worried about the characters. Exactly, and that's a, there's an old. I'm sure you know this already. You went to the, the, the you taught several classes on writing. You've been to several writing classes, things of that nature. One of the first thing they tell you is to make sure that you're supposed to be mean to your characters. You're not supposed to be giving them all kinds of nice, uh, frilly days. They should have. They should suffer. That's the way the, the real actual drama and conflict comes from is them suffering. Yeah, you you have to be worried as as to whether or not they're going to survive. Now, you know, granted, Fantastic Four, we're pretty sure. Most of them are going to survive by the end of the issue, right? Mm -hmm. But we still have to make sure that you know that you're worried about what's happening and that you're, yeah. you're, you're concerned. And uh, one of the things I've always been the proudest of in my career is that uh, back in the day when people used to write actual letters to the comic books, they would always, you know, be writing letters about the characters. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't like. What's happening to Thor here? I don't like, you know, what's happening to to Johnny. Can't you, you know, make life a little easier for Ben? And I've always been thrilled about the fact that this is what they care about, because, you know, I, uh, Ron friends and I used to have the, well, we we don't have to have the discussion anymore, but we used to have this discussion years ago that w when when our work is working the best, it means we're invisible. Mm. That the readers don't realize there's a writer, don't realize there's an artist. Maybe on on some level they do, but are just so totally drawn into the story that that's all they care about. Exactly. And that's you know, it, you know, my job is to suck you guys in. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You by the throat on that first page and just suck you through you know all ten pages so fast that you can't realize. You know what a lousy writer I am. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you did a great job at that. And you mentioned earlier how the biggest, the most important part of these stories to you was the actual humanity of the characters themselves. And I know that you're kind of famous for as you, like you just said that you would write, um, if you could, you still be writing for some of these characters now to this day. You got a chance to write for Jughead again. A, you have kind of had a, a tendency to kind of reveal more about a character the longer you go on as opposed to repeating things over and over again. So the characters do become, because they're so fleshed out, they do feel so real, which is a great thing. That's something I noticed that was, I was younger when I read Spider-Man that you would write and Spider-Girl too, as they felt more and more real as I read, as I read more and more about them from uh, your series. Well, you know, that's kind of my job is to really get in the characters' heads and really explore the characters. I get I'm sometimes amazed when, um, you know, I, I hear about some of the young writers today. They um, they're on a book for six issues, and then they write a two-page farewell about, you know, all their lives they wanted to write this character. Now they've said everything they have to say about the character. And I'm thinking, in six issues, you said everything. You <laughs> character boy you had nothing really important to say did you <laughs> uh, and, you know and I, like i said i don't want to you know you know come across as the old fart but anybody who sees me knows i'm an old fart so what am i gonna do i can't hide it <laughs> <laughs> you know uh it, it, you know i used to think that you know if you're on a book for two or three years you're just getting into the character you're just mm -hmm. kind of understanding the the essence of the character themselves Right. And uh, and the world around the characters, because you know, everybody in the series should have their own lives. Right. Um, yeah, should have their own subplots, their own things, and that's, you know, one of the things. You know, 
uh, you know, I, I've always tried to do with, you know, certainly with Ron Friends and 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 Paul Ryan and and Ron Lim and Herb Tribune and all the other guys, the great guys, Pat Olaf, all, all the guys I've been privileged to work with. Um, most of the time when we're on the phone, we're just discussing the characters. The stories kind of like themselves, but mm. the, you know we're, we're you know discussing you know different aspects of the characters. One of the first arguments that Ron Friends and I had is what Peter Park puts on his pizza. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we now we have to ask what does he put on his pizza? Exactly. Okay. You know, peppers and onions, and Ron believes but you know green olives. And I green olives. Of, yeah, green olives. Uh, now I like green olives on my pizza, but I, I have Peter is would be his tradition. He'd have a, he'd be a black olive kind of guy. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe right. black olives, maybe black olives. Green olives is very that's a that seems much like too akin to martinis and uh, fancy full adult stuff than for Peter. Well, you know, I I like green olives and Ron likes green olives, but just because we like it doesn't mean Peter's gonna like it. Sure, right. Yeah. And you guys are adults. You guys are grown men. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh man, you guys. Yeah. Just since, we're, about that. since we're on a topic of Spider-Man, obviously you he's probably one of the most popular characters you've worked on, if not the, with the constant amount of runs and movies now, most recently. Have you been like keeping up with any of the new movies, even from like 20 years ago with the first Raimi Spider-Man movie? How did you feel about the movie adaptations of them? Um, I enjoyed the Raimi, the, the Raimi uh, movies. Uh, you know, the third one... <laughs> <laughs> right. The, the, the one thing I liked about the third one is when Peter accidentally uh, slams into Mary Jane, because um, I had done that in one of my comics, and everybody thought, "Oh, he hit Mary Jane. How could he hit Mary Jane?" Well, Raimi showed them how he could hit Raimi, <laughs> Mary Jane yeah. Yeah. by accident. Um, and um, you know, I, I I thought Raimi had a great handle on on the on the characters and that sort of stuff. I, uh, you know, the, the, the things that I didn't like are, you know, I, I thought the whole Dr. Octopus thing was a little too similar to the Green Goblin thing. And, you know, and I think they tried to shove way too much into the third movie. But aside from that, I thought they had some really great, con you know, um, you know, really great characterizations, a lot of fun. I remember the first movie, I'm sitting through the movie thinking, oh, there's Jerry, there's the baddest, there's me, there's Jerry again. Ah, I feel a little sad. And, I, you know, I, I got a big kick out of it. I've seen seen the movies, I, I except for the last one. I, I haven't seen um, uh, No Way Home. No, no Way Home. No. That's, you know... Uh, that's due to the pandemic, but I but I look forward to seeing it. I uh, I really loved Into the Spider Verse. Yeah, even though I hadn't read a you know read a Miles Morales comic book beforehand, so I didn't know Miles. But that movie I think is is the best of all the movies. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I completely agree, hard agree. I, uh, all right. Well, I, I love that movie, and I loved how they explained such a complicated thing as alternate universes in such a simple way. Yeah, um, I, I thought the the movie was brilliant, and and you know anything that has Peter Paul in it, it's got my yeah. vote. <laughs> right, <laughs> right, uh, and that's something else that you do that you that you've been quoted talking about is how you want comic books to be fun. Comics should, should actually people should enjoy reading them. It should, like you said, obviously these Fantastic Four took a ride, but yeah, that makes perfect sense. That's your ethos. Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we're, we're an entertainment medium. We're, we're supposed to be entertaining people, right? And uh, there, there should be a certain amount of fun. Um, you know, I, I I emphasized it a lot, Spider Girl, that every once in a while she's web swinging through the air, thinking, "Wow, this is terrific!" <laughs> you guys, if I could fly or that sort of stuff, I'd be having a ball. Yes, right? absolutely. And I absolutely. and I think that uh, you know, real life uh, can can be somewhat di distressing. Uh, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a you know, kind of a small pandemic running around. Oh, mm -hmm. this is going on. Okay, I didn't. Mm -hmm. know. Okay. A lot of people are very depressed these days. So, uh, you know, we we need our comics to brighten our lives, Absolutely. even though we're, we're worried whether or not our characters are going to survive. Right, <laughs> right, right. 
uh, and just a real quick question I had about this. This is something I always wondered. Is that obviously because Peter Parker grows up and has um, uh, has May Parker, the uh, Spider Girl. So I was wondering what it's like because you wrote for Spider Man originally. What it's like to write for that character to now be grown up and have a child himself. What it was like to kind of like have a, a transition uh, going from boy to man with with Peter. Oh, I, I, I you know, I was having a ball with that because um, I, uh, you know, I got to have Peter, you know, show the world, you know, how, you know, a parent reacts as opposed to, you know, how a teenager reacts. Because um, when, you know, Peter Parker was a teenager, he had no problem about going out risking his life and, uh, you know, fighting super villains. When his daughter is doing it, he's you know forbidding her to go out <laughs> right <laughs> totally against him being spider oh no and, you know mary jane points, pointed out to him at one point peter you, you, you were her age when you were doing the same thing and his right. his reaction was it was different i knew what i was doing which is <laughs> every parent feels about their children exactly. uh, don't you know do what i say not what i actually did <laughs> exactly. right right the hypocrite the, the hypocrite kind of uh principle right but, you know, but it but it's a natural reaction and, and i i remember so many you know so many readers were taken aback by peter's attitude you know oh no no peter would be very supportive yeah wait till your daughter wait till you have a daughter exactly and, you know, and she comes to you at one point and says uh you know i want to be a cop my my brother, um, his daughter, at one point, thought she wanted to be a police officer. And my, my brother was hysterical. He was like, oh, I, it's too dangerous. I, I can't, you know, I, I don't think I could do it. And I said, listen, you know, when you were her age, you were in Vietnam. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, man. He said that was different. I knew what I was doing. <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> so, another question on May Parker. Um, obviously, again, like he, uh, like Ethan said before, you wrote with Peter himself. What most kids kind of maybe either either take resemble their parents in a lot of aspects, or they be completely different from their parents. How did you go about kind of taking on what traits did you? Maybe you didn't want to take any at all. The traits from Peter that she maybe wanted to carry down to May to kind of help her give her own spin on that personality. Well, if, if you, you know, look at the very first story, we figured out that she, she was the perfect amalgam between Mary Jane and Peter. And that's why she's got a, a, a few friends that are geek friends and a few friends that are, you know, the popular friends. Right, right. And, and initially she was torn between the two groups of of a friend, which is, you know, a, a metaphor for, you know, how Peter, you know, Peter was always on the geek side, Mary Jane, the popular side, and Mary Jane kind of, you know, you know uh, snuck Peter over to the popular side. Mm -hmm. But we, you know, we set that stuff up from, from the beginning. <laughs> now it's for the beginning. At the time we did that first What If story, we thought that was going to be the one and only Spider-Girl story. Oh, wow. Right? I didn't know that. Yeah. We, we, because Ron and I are crazy, uh, we had to work out the, the entire world. And, and Ron did all these character sketches for Mary Jane and, you know, the Avengers of that time and that sort of stuff. And, um, you know, we turned those into an editor when, when we did the, the story. And he thought it was a pitch. He thought it was a pitch for a series. But, no, we're lunatics and we do that for every every story we do it's a testament to how good it was that he actually thought it was worthy of being a series uh, right. it's pretty crazy and you know to, it was a surprise to us where they asked hey can you do do you think you could do six six more spider girl stories and, yeah we can do six you know six of anything <laughs> uh, <laughs> right right so we only intended to do six it's crazy right a yeah. character that you and uh, Mr. John Romita took part in creating, being Dazzler, mm -hmm. which is an amazing uh, addition to the X Men in the mutant world. Tell me how you guys went about like conceptualizing, like maybe how she was or how her powers worked in general. How did you go about that? Yeah, I, 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 um, I, I, you know, I, I think I got the Dazzler assignment because I had. Uh, 
you know, worked at Archie and the Archies and um, uh, trying to think, oh, what's his name? The record producer who did the Archies. I mean, for uh, in, the, in, the, in the canon, in the books? No, no, in the actual, the actual record, you know, Sugar Sugar and all that other stuff. Oh, uh, Marvin, not Marvin Barry. Um, very Gordy. I, I'm thinking. I'm thinking. I'm thinking of all of like those, that same era of, of producers. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what the, the real life one is. But we'll, we'll, we'll put it in there in the in post. We'll make sure we add it in there. I'll do the, the research and find it in. Yeah. But anyway, because I I work with them and they, you know, I, I, they weren't sure what they wanted to do with Dazzler initially, and I think they just grabbed me because like you know Archie. This is an Archie kind of character, that sort of thing, and. Uh, you know, and then, you know, you, you start looking at the character. And um, I remember initially they they thought her power was that uh, they, they told me that they were thinking of Bo Derek to be the Dazzler. And that oh. her power was that she's so beautiful that she can compel people to tell the truth. And I remember saying, tell people, you know, force people to tell the truth. That's not, you know, really a great, you know, power performance. <laughs> Or movies or television or anything else. Um, and they said, well, I, I remember one of the guys said, because uh, they had a TV guy, a, a movie guy, and a um, record guy there. And one of them said to me, all right, wise guy, what do you think her power should be? So I said, her name's Dazzler. She should have something to do with light. Right. And these guys looked like I had said this most brilliant thing. <laughs> 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 You bring a thousand comic book writers in and you say the name Dazzler, you know, at least 999 are going to say it has something to do with light. Right, you know? right, right, right. So I thought, man, you know, I'm not dealing with the best of the gene pool. Here. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but what's cool about Dazzler, too, is how she manipulates the sound to make the to create the light. It's an interesting idea that she, I'm guessing it was your idea, too, that her weakness is she can't produce the sound that she's able to draw from it has to be some other source to do it which yeah. is cool the idea of again the keeping the balance with characters and uh giving it something to work for well yeah it, it just you know uh, right now when i look at it i think it, oh, it was all very natural uh, i was probably pounding my head against the wall for a couple of hours to make it look so natural um, right. you know again when you do your job correctly you, you make it look easy <laughs> right, right. Make it look effortless, and, and that reminds me too. Uh, I know it's famously you were the one who brought up the idea that Mary Jane already knew that Spider Man was um, that Peter Parker was Spider Man, um, and it seemed like effortless. Like people, are like yeah, of course you would. When did you yourself though? When did you really think about the idea that she would that she would in fact know how, how did that come about? Well, while I was typing the plot. <laughs> Why you're right? Why you're right, Neil? Well, I was writing the plot. Um, so, Ron friends and I had worked out that issue, and the next issue, and the issue after that. We had gone to the editor. We got all of our approvals. Um, I think th this had to do with uh, I think Thomas Fireheart, the Puma had broken into Peter's apartment the, the issue before, and. Uh, this was the aftermath of that. And um, uh, I forget what the explanation is, but Peter had an explanation as to why Fireheart came to him. And um, I'm typing the plot and I get to that scene um, and uh, Peter's supposed to give his, his explanation. But as I'm typing the plot, I, I think, and Mary Jane turns to Peter and says, Peter, enough of the bullshit. I know you're Spider-Man, I've always known. <laughs> and, look at him, what? I thought, where the heck did that come from? <laughs> and I thought, man, you know, that kind of makes sense to me. Uh, I think, yeah, yeah, she, she has always known. So I called up Ron and I said, Ron, um, so I got to the end of our plot and I got a different ending. And I told him that and he goes, no, you can't do that. And then he stops and he goes, you know that that makes sense <laughs> yeah. he says and then he starts giving me scenes from jerry conway's stuff that yeah now this scene makes sense 
Right. We go, oh. So I go, okay. So we, the next day we go to the uh, editor and the editor has the same reaction as Ron. No, no, you can't. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute. Hmm. He says, well, we got to ask Shooter because this is a major change with the character. Right. So right. We, walk, we walk in and he says to Shooter, so blah, blah, blah. And Mary Jane says, I know, I've, I've always known. And Shooter says, no, she she wouldn't have known because if she had known, and then he pauses for a few minutes, he goes, wait a minute, yeah. Yeah, she, of course she knows. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> and Shooter says, yeah, this makes perfect sense. Go ahead and do it. That is crazy. It was very crazy because Ron and I knew the next two issues, we had to throw those out in the garbage now. Wow. You know, we couldn't we couldn't use those stories because they were based upon, you know, a, a different direction. Now we had to deal with Mary J. Noah. But it seems so logical. Like, it actually made, it's like, yeah, if you were around somebody that much and they always took off, it's like, yeah, they're going to figure it out pretty soon. So it's, it's funny that you're saying like that you, 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 all, you guys didn't realize it until literally you put it down on the page and actually fully yeah. put everything in. It's a massive pivot, essentially. It, it was a massive pivot. It kind of changed the direction of where we were going with the book. Um, it ultimately led to their marriage. Um, although my friends and I, our plan was the Mary Jane was going to leave him at the altar. But oh, jeez. <laughs> You really no, mean to your character. Yeah, you are mean. You take you your characters to a whole other level. <laughs> you are mean to your character. Oh man. Oh, yeah. No, he, Peter would have been crushed. Are you kidding me? Yeah, I mean, wouldn't be. Wouldn't be. Oh, you know, but, but you'd have to buy the next issue to find out what happened. Fair <laughs> enough. The divorce. Yeah. Getting so, into um, your characters again. Do you kind of? Would you say you kind of feel like a protective father? in the sense of when you see other people maybe take on different arcs for your characters or even like in the movies do you kind of hyper critic criti oh my gosh i can't talk today criticize the characters written by other people um i i've been aware that, that you can do that and be, be that so whenever i leave a book i completely leave it i don't read it for a couple of years i don't look at it um because it takes me a couple of years to get the characters' voices out of my head. Right. And, I, and I think it's very unfair um, that I, I would look at a line of dialogues, and say, oh, Peter would never say that. That's ridiculous. Oh, you, know, he, he, you, know, you know, Thor would never do that. You know, And, and I, I just think it's unfair because, you know, when I got to play in the sandbox, you know, nobody told me what to do. Right. So why should I tell anybody else what to do? That's um, smart. So, you know, now when, when I look at the movies, a lot of times I'm just, you know, I'm just thrilled that they, hey, they're actual movies. Right. You know, when I was there, I, I was so desperate to get a movie or a TV show done. Um, you know, I, I spent a lot of time trying to get movies done and that sort of stuff. I, I often joke about the fact that I worked on every version of the Spider-Man movies, except the ones that actually got made. <laughs> is, that, is, that, is that true you actually worked on scripts for the theatrical cuts at least seven or eight different versions of the spider-man movies none of them which got made oh wow wow well, what are some are there are there what? any differences in, in, in the, the versions you saw are there any things you can you can share with us about the stories you had in mind uh i don't i don't remember the details at this stage of the game you know and the only fantastic four movie i worked on was the one that wasn't released Oh, that, oh, the, the one, the Corman one? The Corman one. Oh, wow. I've, I have seen that. I have seen that one. Well, the that, character, he, yeah. Here's the funny part about the Corman one. They had a budget of a million dollars. Was that Jeez. high? It was, it was that high, yeah. It was that high, but, yeah, it was pretty high. you know, in those days, there was a TV show called L.A. Law, um, which had no special effects or anything else like that. It was an hour television show. And the budget for L.A. Law was a million and a half. <laughs> right. So those guys did pretty damn good for a million bucks. They did a whole, that's why I was, I mean, they, it's legendary how little they had to work with. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah I've seen it all, multiple times. All the sets were pre-existing sets because they had no money to build sets or anything. They, they yeah. did a terrific job. I, you yeah. know, 
I, I thought it was very unfair that their film was never re released. I understand that the whole purpose of doing that was just to keep the rights. Because mm -hmm. by spending that million dollars, it saved them, you know, 19 or 20, you know, 19 million dollars, which is what it would have cost to, you know, to, to keep the rights, you know, 20 million or something like that. But, uh, you know, those actors put their heart and soul into it, you know, their heart and souls into that work. And, you know, it was very unfair to them. Yeah, yeah. it definitely was. Well, I didn't know. That's that's amazing. Okay. It was a, you know, it's a good movie, uh, you know, that the final scene with that sticking out of the way for the people it still cracks me up. Uh, listen, they, they did the best they could with what they did. I would argue that it's still the best Fantastic Four movie out there. <laughs> I mean, having seen all of them, like that's probably the best one. I don't know. Fantastic Four with the Silver Surfer was a pretty good movie. Yeah, I like that. I enjoyed that. It's yeah, it's it's it, it's 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 fun. I'll put it that way. Fair enough. It has fun. It has some fun. You know, the, the, the Doctor Doom stuff is goofy, but uh, but the rest of the movie, I thought, man, they I, they did a pretty good job with the Surfer. And, you know, I like this. You know, well, I mean, they didn't call him Galactus, but yeah, they didn't call him Galactus. All right, but but you know there is a scene where you see the, the Galactus headpiece in the cloud, and I, you know I'm going to tell you something. You know, a 12 foot guy in a kilt may work in a comic book. You know, on the screen not so much. Uh, I don't. <laughs> it's it's a harder enough. sell. It yeah. is a harder sell. Yeah, fair enough. Right. Can I? Obviously, uh, you were around for a lot of the innovations when it comes to comics, and you worked for probably, at least today, the most infamous comic company. And Stanley being kind of transcending comics and kind of being an icon, being in all the movies or whatever, you hear his name a lot, and people love Stanley for rightfully so. But I feel like one person that kind of gets forgotten in that mix is Jack Kirby and his contributions to things that Marvel had going on. Do you feel like he's kind of underappreciated in the whole process of things that Marvel had going on? No, no. I, I, I think Stan. You know, I, I think it, everybody knows Stanley, mm -hmm. but but they would have known Stan anyway because Stan was a self promoter, yeah. and he had this magnetic personality. Um, the the wonderful thing about Stanley is whenever you were with him, he made you feel like you were the most important person in his world. Right on. And he just had that. He he had that magic um, that drew people to him. You know, Jack, probably the finest comic book storyteller, comic book artist the world has, you know, ha has ever seen or or will ever see. Um, did not have that kind of personality, mm -hmm. um, and you know, you know, we're all stuck with the personalities we have. Uh, you know, we, you don't see me doing many TV interviews because I don't have that kind of magnetic personality either. And uh, you know, listen, I, I I belong where I am, sitting in a locked room with with my computer all day long. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I, I actually belong, and I know it. Uh, okay. I don't have the personality to be out there and, you know, hawk and stand. Uh, stand, stand um, you know, in terms of the the industry itself, you know anybody who be more than Jack? I mean, come on, our our whole industry is based on with Jack. You know, when I was at Marvel, you know, we all loved Jack. And um, you know, we're always, you know, we, we're the biggest fan geeks around. You right. know, you see a bunch of Marvel creators, you know, circling Jack, with, you know, when we could back in the day. Uh, right. Anytime we saw Jack, we, you know, we'd run up to him and and be just as goofy as as you know, you guys would be with your favorite creators. Right. right. Absolutely. Um, and uh, you know, uh, you know, Marvel is still um, reprinting Jack's stuff left and right, and, and uh, I, you know, I assume his his family is still getting the, uh, the 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 reprint rates and everything else like that. I I, I don't know what they they deal with. But at some point, Disney and, and and the Jack Kirby estate made some deal. Oh, okay. I have no idea whether or not they they got a lump sum or what, but. 
Um, you know, Jack, you know, Jackie, you know, has isn't always has been and always will be the king of comics. Yeah. I, 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 I'm just speaking, you know, from my fan geeks. Stuff. I, I've been a Jack Kirby geek, you know, most of my life. Right. That's great. That's great. And, and that kind of that kind of leads me into my next question, though, is how because when you were, of course, editor in chief at Marvel, you were known for being very open to having uh, taken on to accepting other ideas from from the creators and writers and uh, artists themselves, and much more so than those before you, your predecessors, essentially. Uh, what is one of the biggest lessons you learned from being such an open-minded uh, editor? Be, be open to stealing good ideas. When <laughs> <I mean, laughs> comes in with a good idea, you, you know, don't be an idiot. Don't let your ego get in the way of your wallet. Right. Uh, right. You know, I. Uh, one of the things I truly love about comics is it's a team sport. And it really is a team sport. Um, you know, I, I, I am very old school. Whenever I'm working on something, I like to be able to talk to the artist and um, understand, you know, you know what the artist wants to likes to draw that sort of stuff. You know, Ron, friends, and I, you know, uh, you know, we still talk at least once a week. That's great. That's great. And and. And if we're working on something, much more often than that. Um, uh, and um, you know, I, I think it's very important just to be be open. You know, this is a creative medium. Um, right. Yeah. You know, the story. Uh, I think Denny O'Neill used to have a sign on his on his wall that said, "The story is boss." Hmm. Which, which means the story is the most important thing. That final story. So anything we do to make that story better, you know, we should do. There, there is, you know, no effort that should not go into improving the story. Absolutely. And, um, you know, I, you know, I, I, I remember one time, uh, you know, with, uh, a Spider Girl story uh, back in the days when, when. They they would letter the, the 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 comic book on the board. So when the anchor is inking it, he would read the story. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, Al Williamson calls me up. He says, you know, I'm reading this thing about this one kid here, um, and uh, you know, I was wondering if he should do this somewhere along the line. And I thought, hey, Al, that's a pretty good idea. Yeah, I think he's. He's going to do that. We'll, we'll see if we can get it in next issue or the issue after that. But that's kind of cool, right? And I just love the fact that you know the ink was calling me up, giving me story ideas, right? right. And I think, you know, you know, but 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 that is an uncommon. I mean, I, I, my limited experience as a writer with working with like the studios and everything else, even with clients, that is a. It is much less often that you'll have them so open to receiving different ideas when other people think that their stuff is is like you said their egos are so much bigger they think whatever they have is grander and when you pitch something new to them they're always their knee-jerk reaction is to push back against it so that you your reaction was kind of the opposite is is uh, refreshing in lots of ways well uh thank you i just I, i think that's part of the reason why ron friends and i have been able to work work together for I'm going to say 30 years, but it's probably <laughs> <laughs> we won't fact check. We won't fact check. Right. Well, you feel free to. Um, we're, we're actually working on a new sto- Thor story now. Um, oh, really? It's great. It, I know that. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's because neither one of us has an ego. We, we're, you know, all we care about is the story. There, there have been times when I've, I've come in with some ideas for a story, and he's, he's come in with some ideas, and. And I said, you know, I, you know, I like your ideas better, so we could throw my, you know, and, yeah. and we just, you know, that that's you have to be open to everything, right? And um, you know, I, I yeah, I know certain guys. I, I, I I've had guys, you know, pontificate to me about how they they have to protect their brand, and they, you know, and they yeah. Yeah, hate it when the artist so. uh, varies at all from, you know, from anything that that they want because it is it's off brand for them and that sort of thing 
And I'm thinking, hey, you know, I, I've been in comic books for 50, this is my 50th year in comics. Congrats, congrats. You know? And and other fiction, even longer than that. That that I'm not even sure what I saw my first short story. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and I think you know, yeah, I, I guess somewhere along the along the line, I should I should work out a brand. <laughs> Right, <laughs> or, or, or maybe I'll just keep on doing stories and worry about brands to the to the younger, smarter guys. Right? No, that's, that's cool. I love it. You know, like nah, it, you know, I wouldn't be a fan if I didn't ask. I and mean, you may not be able to say anything about it. Is there any beans you can spill about the upcoming Thor story you're working on? Um. Well, I I, I think it's for some. There's there's a special Thor thing where. I'm not sure what number, what number it's going to be, because mm -hmm. uh, Marvel keeps changing numbers back and forth. Um, uh, is it you know everybody wants a number one now? So, right. Yeah. But there, there's some sort of uh, a special coming up. I think it's 750 or something like that. Okay, mm -hmm. that's a seminal yeah. number. Yeah. And uh, they've asked us to do a 10-page story. Uh, that features the Enchantress and Odin. And um, wow, okay. You know, uh, the Enchantress, uh, of course, is being the Enchantress. You know, trying to, you know, outfox Odin, and Odin is being Odin, trying to outfox the Enchantress. And uh, fun and games ensue. <laughs> <laughs> right on thank you for spoiling that I, again i mean he's a fan i i wouldn't be a fan if i didn't ask you heard it i was like oh i gotta know um, it's interesting it's only 10 pages too okay yes yeah, yeah. and but you know ron and i stick we stuff a lot in 10 pages you do right yeah. you do. Our, our last uh I, i remember when we did a thunderstrike story a couple of years ago for a comic called thor the worthy and uh, somebody called me up and said, you, you know, you have more than 10 pages than most guys have in two issues. <laughs> <laughs> Only two issues? Boy, we're falling down on the job. We got to get more stuff in the comic book. Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. You've worked on a million different characters, but we do know that you did cross over to DC to work on Superboy and some other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Now, how was that internal did you have any kind of internal confliction on going over to the kind of the rival of marvel at the time right. working with dc yeah. yeah no i uh you know i listen i grew up on the dc characters too um, they they originally asked ron and i to do a, a thing called superman beyond which neither one of us had heard of um uh and and we did a one shot and i found out that they liked it so much they wanted us to do more stuff um That's great. It's impressive you know so you know we you know we, we, we both did more stuff um you you were received well it wasn't like like they were like oh this 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 guy's a traitor or this guy is like you know he's coming to us it, they, they actually came with open arms which is nice it's different well, you know a lot of the marvel people were at dc at the time right and, you know bob maris was there and bobby chase and a lot of the guys that i used to work with um so you know i, I consider all these people family so that's great, that's great. you know i it it, it it was odd because um every once in a while i talk to somebody at dc and they'd say yeah you know we want this character to be like Spider-Man, because Spider-Man, basically, he only he only gets into his costume because you know he wants to sell pictures of himself. <laughs> so it's a very monetary thing, and I go, "Have you actually read Spider-Man?" Right. <laughs> <laughs> no innocent shall ever suffer be because I failed to act. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> That's what Spider-Man's about. It has nothing to do with it. Uh, the, the picture, the, the monetary thing is, you know, is an add-on. Right, and he's still broke. He's always broke. So, he's always that's broke. Right. I I used to think that uh, you know Spider Man was a series based on uh, on Jewish guilt. Mm. Um, it's a uh, you know Spider Man learned that when he fails, people die, as opposed to Spider Girl, who learned that when she succeeds, people live. 
Right. It's a subtle but profound difference. Right. I never, you know, never thought about that. He always approached it very optimistically because if she succeeds, everybody's going to live. Where That's Peter always approached different. it very negatively. That's very different. Yeah. And yeah. And I often point out The Punisher is a series based on Catholic guilt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> very, very kind way, came up with the Punisher. Stanley came up with 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 Spider Man. Um, I, I mean, we need to have that like that 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 monogram somewhere that the on that in the title. And, 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 yeah, yeah, exactly. Spider Man Jewish guilt. <laughs> Spider Man colon Jewish guilt. Yeah. Oh yeah. man! Hey, listen, um, I, I, I'll. Like I've said before, I'm a nutcase. I really study this stuff and try to figure out you know, what is motivating this character. Right. Um, you know, that's, I, that's, I think that's the heart of it. That's the heart of the story. That's the right. heart of the whole thing. I, 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 you know, used to look at the Thor and Odin, and you know, Odin's attitude was, "Hey, you know, we got a nice little business here, protecting Asgard," and and Thor saying, "Yeah, but we can franchise. We can, we can also protect Earth. We can also protect the universe." And he's saying, well, "Why don't you come back and marry a nicest guardian girl?" <laughs> you know? Oh right. man, jeez. Right My last there. question for you, Mister Defalco, is I want to spin up, take up all your time. I can talk to you. I can talk yeah, to you for hours. Most, most hour, yeah. Um, as me, I kind of at some point wanted to be an uh, up and coming writer, an aspiring writer, and for others like me that may be in that field, what advice would you give for somebody that's starting out and wanting to kind of create characters in the same vein as you did? Well, um, you know, it's it, it, this is a crazy time. Um, when I was starting out, there were dozens and dozens of magazines that bought short stories, uh, you know, fantasy short stories, science fiction short stories, mysteries, thrillers, spy short stories, tons of magazines. Um, so. And they, and they needed to fill them, so you know, guys like me managed to, you know, sell a bunch of short stories. And the comic book industry was expanding and getting bigger and bigger, so they needed guys to fill fill those roles. Um, these days, there aren't the, those magazines. It's been replaced by independent comics and the internet. Yeah, right. Um, you know, I, I used to say to guys who wanted to break into Marvel, do a do a six-page story, do a ten-page story, and send it into editors because, you know, if they like that story, they can always use it in the back of an annual or the back of a special or something like that. Um, but you know, these days an annual is, is part of a big event, so I don't think that trick works anymore. And uh, you know, these days, you know, when was the last time you read a comic book which had a complete story, you know, in the issue? Yeah. And now everything is a six-page story, and and most of the people that they're bringing in are, you know, former novelists, you know, television, not even, you know, current novelists, current television writers, current movie writers. Um, you know, editors are a cowardly and superstitious lot. They only want to hire you if they know somebody else has hired you.、Mm-hmm. So、what I suggest to anybody who wants to be a writer is be a writer. Yeah, bring the place where you can sell your stuff, whether it's a local newspaper,、um, you know, or writing reviews for for you know any local magazines.、Um, be a writer first. Be a guy who does comics second.、Uh, You know, I, you know, I'm, I'm a very lucky guy. I've managed to you know, deal with a lot of media and, and a lot of different types of writing.、Uh, I love comics. I always come back to comics.、Um, but you know,、uh, my family is very thankful that comics are not the only thing I wrote because, <laughs> <laughs> because、yeah. you know, we're in good shape because of that. It's great. That's great.、Uh, but thank, but, thank you so much. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry. But, but really, just write. Find any place that'll you know pay you whatever small amount, because once you're published,、um, 
it, it says to other edi- editors, this guy is publishable. So right. before I joined the, the industry, I, I had a whole portfolio of articles and newspaper newspaper articles and magazine articles and short stories that I had written, you know, before I started. You know, I often, I often, you know, joke you know, when I suddenly appeared on Marvel. Hey, it only took me ten years to become an overnight success. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, but that's perfect, and that's sage advice. It really does. Go ahead and start cutting your teeth. Don't wait until you have the big gig to start writing. You have to obviously yeah. learn how to. You don't. Nobody starts off at the top. No, you, start, you can't. It's a work that way. Starts at the. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, I want to push one thing. Ron, friends, and I, you know, we, we did this Indiegogo thing. Mm-hmm. We, we came out with a comic book called Tom the Falcon and Ron Friends's The Right Project. All right. Here, here's a 32-page comic book with three complete stories in it. Um, yeah, nice. <laughs> it's ambitious. I don't they, see that anywhere else. I don't think I can think <laughs> no, of no, that's because we're crazy and we make life difficult. And <laughs> any one of those stories would be a whole issue, at least a whole issue, with with anybody else. It's on Indiegogo. Um, you know, we'll check it out. Uh, Yeah, we'll put the link up there too. Yeah, yeah. We we we, you know, we still make life harder for ourselves because, you know, we want to be worth the time and money and effort you guys do do to pick up our work. So we really want you to enjoy this. Really want you to enjoy the stories. We want that. We we want you to spend a good ten fifteen minutes reading our ten ten page story. And at the end, we want you to say, "Man, I'm exhausted." <laughs> That's fantastic. But, you get an actual was, boom for your buck, which is, which yeah. is great. Which yeah, because you know, I, you know, sometimes a lot of I, I, I don't want to criticize, but sometimes I pick up a new comic book that costs me four four dollars, five dollars, and I'm done with it in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the story hasn't started yet. Right, you're left wanting. You're yeah, left wanting. and I and you know, I think that's the problem with comic book sales today. There's no. When you finish a comic book, you you should be satisfied. Yes,、yeah. you want the next issue, but you should you you should have a feeling of satisfaction. And、yeah. um, you know, we want cake with the whipped cream. There you go. There you、yeah. go. <laughs> There you go. Well, we won't keep you too much longer. There's one last part、um, that we have on the show. And、uh, do you want to roll it, Dev? Do you have it? Do you yes. Give me one second. Here we go. All right, Tom. This is a little segment we call "Either Or." This is where I ask、uh, my co-host or our guest a, a hypothetical question, and they have to give me their answer, and they have to show the work for their answer. So today, since you are our guest, the question is going to be posed to you, and it is a simple yet straightforward and important one: Betty or Veronica? <laughs> um, I think you know everybody wants Veronica, but you know, I, I can tell you from my own experience, you'd be much, much happier with Betty. <laughs> okay, okay,、right. um, it's wisdom. Yeah, wisdom. Well, listen, I, you know, I am,、uh, you know, I, I am a happy guy. Because I, you know, I married Betty. That's great. So, That's great. Congratulations. That's so, great. I, I, you know, and I hope everybody gets their Betty. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, Fantastic. Mr. DeFalco, thank you so much for taking the time. I know we, it's, it's been a month in the making of us kind of scheduling this out and、yes. being patient. So thank you so much for coming on and giving us time because I really appreciate it talking to a legend in the game and me being a fan of comics. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I, I read Spider Girl a lot as a kid, so I actually really, really appreciate. And you should continue to read Spider Girl. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Once、yeah. again, thank you very much. It's it's nice to be remembered.、Um, you know, I,、uh, you know, I have had and still have a great time at you know doing comics, and、um, you know, I'm 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 glad to hear that you know guys like you enjoyed them. Absolutely. Yes,、Absolutely. sir. I mean, you're one of the reasons. I'm not going to get too much on this, but、uh, I am a comic book writer and creator now, 
uh, and uh, one of the reasons I actually was motivated and inspired to write is because of the books that I read that you created. So, so thank you for helping me find my passion. Well, good. And keep up with the passion, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You know, it, uh, it, it can be a lonely life. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when you, when you really get hooked into it, um, you know, it, it can be, you know, the hours go by very, very quickly. I, I, I look back and think, you know, I, I used to get up at 5.30 in the morning and I'd be at the, you know, the computer by six and, you know, work till about three o'clock and then take a break. And then every once in a while, I'll go back in to, you know, futz. You know, I, I'm just going to futz for a few minutes. And then at about two o'clock in the morning, look and think, yeah, may, maybe it's time to go to bed because I got to get up and go to heaven house. We've <laughs> 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 got it all over again. Right. But, um, I love it. I love you know, it. But thanks, it, thanks again for inspiring us. Thanks for, I mean, not just you and me, me and Charlie, but for all the, 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 the fans out there. You, uh, we really appreciate it. Really do. Thank you. That that you know that means more to me than you could possibly imagine. Thank you very much, guys. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, guys, this has been another episode of the Then and Now podcast. Thank you guys for tuning in and watching for whatever platform. Maybe if you heard it, because we are on audio platforms now too. Uh, and we'll see you guys next episode. Thank you. Take it easy, guys. Thank you, Mr. Paco. <laughs>